Today, I have a very interesting guest, a gentleman named Damon Motes. Damon Motes is a coppersmith. And he contacted me because he had seen my father's stuff and just wrote a fascinating email that just showed me how much he knows about this information and coming from it from a different perspective. And I wanted to talk to him, not just because he's interesting, but also I think it's good to get different perspectives on this work. And we all have different things to contribute. I am not an academic. I'm not a scholar. I worked as a video and audio producer in New York. I came to it actually because I worked on a program that featured a theologian, a gentleman named Houston Smith. And I saw that basically this was going to be on a PBS local station. And I saw that, you know, it was pretty similar to the way my father spoke about religion, about history. And I thought, well, I'm going to do one of those with him someday. What I didn't anticipate and what was so great is that I got the opportunity to do a lot of it. So when my father moved to Los Angeles, where I relocated, he was teaching at a number of schools. And so I was able to go in there and do what I wanted, but on a grander scale. So I used my technical skills in production, which at the time, because it was decades ago, was a lot more difficult than it is now. So getting your hold on digital equipment was expensive and getting a hold of even a lavalier, which, you know, with Amazon today, you can get everything. Everything's affordable. Back then it wasn't. So I was really committed to getting this done. So I brought that group of skills to this. My father basically was not able to, he wasn't finishing his, his books. He was, uh, he was writing all the time. He was studying all the time, but the books weren't getting finished. And so I sort of felt like my job was to do that for him, to at least get this stuff done. He was always writing, but he would get distracted. He was working on the book of Genesis, but then he was working on Jewish languages. But then Yiddish was so fascinating, it needed its own book. And at the same time, the story of Jezebel is so dramatic, he had to write a novel. So there was a lot going on. And finally, I said, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get the Genesis thing done and in my form, in the form I can, because I'm not a scholar, I'm not a writer, I'm not a book editor. And Damon comes to this uh, this area also from a different perspective, which is a coppersmith. So somebody who is hands-on with a material that's been worked and has been part of our civilization for over 5,000 years, I believe. Damon, is it over 5,000? I Ten know. Or uh, <laughs> Ten oh, or more. Okay. So I want to find out, I wanted to find out about that, about um, how somebody who works with the material can relate to what has been going on in history for thousands of years. So I'm introducing Damon Motes, coppersmith. <laughs> okay. So Damon, uh, yeah, how did you, uh, where are you from and how did you come about doing what you're doing? I am from, uh, originally from Birmingham. When I was about five, we moved out to a smaller town. Uh, I think that was in 78. It was a long time ago. So uh, just, you know, small town, uh, pre-internet, uh, but I always loved to read. I always loved the Greek myths in school. I think there were two subjects in school that I made a 99 or 100 on without studying, and that was the Greek myths and geometry. So <laughs> I've always uh, loved math and history and, and the Greek myths for whatever reason, I think just because we can all relate to those there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You're the third person now, and I've only done three, <laughs> who has brought in a math geometry angle to this subject. So that also is interesting. You know, when I'm building something, say if I want to build a chimney cap, or if you build a house, you're, you're building it piece by piece. If I make a chimney cap to match, the, say, a hip roof house where you have the angles, kind of like the pyramid would be a hip roof, hip style roof. Well, if I have to make it to the same pitch, I have to build all that in one piece. That means all the angles have to be just right to match an entire roof. So when you're building something out of one piece, you're, you're not, you know, cut one board, put one board up there. You're doing it on a smaller scale, but yet it has to match. The angle needs to match or maybe add a little bit of steepness to it. And that's where you get into all these these fantastic uh, ratios that we've heard throughout time, the golden ratio or the square root of two, all these things have been in architecture for many, many years, being, you know, just about as long. I mean, they're in the Great Pyramid. That's one of the oldest buildings that we know of. 
the perimeter around the whole Great Pyramid when it had its casing stones on it. And if it came all the way to the top, we, we don't know where the very top piece is, but they've estimated that I think it's 51.8 degrees uh, gives you that, that one angle right there that defines the whole Great Pyramid. So you change that angle, it changes everything about it. So the perimeter around the, the four sides of the base is two times pi ratio to the to the height. Like if it was a tent pole going straight from the ground up to the center peak of it, that that height, um, it's 6.28 would be your your base perimeter equivalent to the height. I think they did it in cubits. So two times pi to the height for the so that that is basically defining a circle but they're doing it with a square and then we find out going way back into mesopotamia there were other people working with this the uh the neo-assyrians you know they had on clay tablets the square root of two figured down to six decimal points so you've got math and then now i'm working with copper love the history of copper you start wanting to wonder about copper how long have they been using copper you know how long does copper last uh you know, and you look into that, the Statue of Liberty lasted 200 years. The copper didn't go bad. It was the iron frame on the inside where it was connected to the copper is what went bad. So so they had to redo that. And as a rope access technician, I took the training for that. I, that was the, the dream job that will, it'll be 200 years before we get to do that again. But to hang from rope and work with copper, I couldn't imagine a cooler job. So maybe something like that will come along. Climbing copper, geometry in the history of those things, they all kind of come together at some point. You'll see these these roads intersect. So when you're studying one thing, uh, you say I'm studying the Old Testament or I'm, I'm reading, you know, about religious uh, documents, you, you know, you have the, the Bronze Sea in Solomon's Temple. This is a big copper bowl. All right, now I'm really interested. So then um, it's got a di diameter of 10 units. Well, and then I think the thickness of the edge, anyway, the 10 comes out, it, that's uh, pi squared, basically. So you've got a circular, we know it's a bowl, we know pi is used in that, but the fact that they use the diameter of 10 means that you can multiply that diameter times pi, and that gives you the circumference uh, around the outside of it, but also using that number 10, which has, you know, it, it's a good number to work with in geometry, and it, and it has also its theological applications so tell us about copper where is copper found uh copper is found i think recently they just discovered uh there's a large copper deposits we know about around the great lakes they recently found and i think through the the process of mining and dumping the this the the stuff they didn't use they were able to dig through that and get a date of 9500 bc in north america that they used copper for a few thousand years and then they stopped okay why did they stop? And there's, there's, we don't know, but there's, there's reasons that I can infer without just from my experience with copper. So one reason would be copper is a really soft metal. So it probably wasn't as important to them other than it just being this cool metal. You can do things, roofing, you make water line out of it, all the things like electrical, we use it. It has more applications today probably than it did then. I think then it was, it was a soft metal it was a, it was like a platform to work off of to mix with other metals. So you've got copper, you mix, you know, tin with it, and you get bronze. It's really something you can do something with. You always hear, okay, the tin is in Afghanistan, and and then there's some in Cornwall, you know, England, and probably by water how a lot of the tin got from Afghanistan to where we are. I mean, it's way easier to carry things by boat than it is to lug them across the desert. So. If you, if you just look at a map, it's kind of easy to see, well, okay, the, the tin is not that far from the headwaters of the Indus River. It'd be easier to put that on a boat and float it down and, and get it there. I think they say back then, a you know, a ship, you could get, it would take a month by foot to do what you could do in a ship by day or on a horse, it would take a week. So, you know, I think you would always want to carry things by boat back then, just like now we would want to put things on an airplane to get them there quicker. So. Uh, but again, you got to know why do you need that first? So it would have to have been found local and discovered local. And again, I think the oldest we have with tin, there's the arsenic bronze, which is just natural copper that had arsenic in it. 
And so I would think, you know, they didn't have metallurgists where they can send things off and have them tested like we do. So you had electrum, which is gold, silver, and copper. It was just that ore that they mined that happened to have those three metals in it. They, they took it for what it was. So they, they probably knew the difference as this, we get more copper out of this ore than we do that, or they didn't probably know what arsenic was and they probably knew people would die from it if you would breathe it. You know, there was probably ways to work around that. They, I think they used it for nearly a thousand years. So it obviously took them a while to, to move into using tin. And then it was still, you had arsenic bronze. So these things don't just come up overnight. They creep in just like, you know, us using oil, I guess, you know, a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, we, we were using whale oil still, I think. So, you know, we, we slowly have this need for oil and then we get, you know, we get better oil and then we need more of it. So I would say that the bronze area probably worked the same way. Uh, we can make these tools out of it. Copper by itself was not really useful back then. We use it. Uh, there was some water line older than the Great Pyramid that was done in Egypt, 300 and something. A water feet. line out of copper, so copper pipes? Yeah, copper pipes. They so okay. hammered the sheets flat and that, then, you know, they rolled them up and they used it for water line. I would like to get deeper into that to see how did they join it together? How did they, did they solder the joints? What metal combination did they use to solder that together with? That That's the kind of things that would interest me as somebody who works with it. Um, you know, how did, what, how, what did they use an iron? Cause I, you know, the hundred year old way of soldering with an iron was to take a chunk of copper on a stick, put it in the coal pot. You would have, you know, your air blowing on that, it would get hot and they would have two of them. And so you would have a guy and they would throw these things with a wooden handle and this red hot iron up to the guy soldering. And he would use that one until it would cool down and you'd have another ready. And so there would be one guy managing the irons is where the terminology too many irons in the fire comes from. That's not from blacksmith and that's from soldering copper. So. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Something we use all the time, but we don't really know where it came from. They had to get to temperature. So temperature, we always hear, well, they, they didn't do iron until after they couldn't get tin because iron's harder to refine. It's it's probably just easier to, to work with the bronze. And, and even after, they still used bronze way on after the Iron Age. It, it didn't go away forever. It came back as civilization did. So their armor, they still would use bronze even down to the Spartans in the 300. That would be around 500 B.C., what qualities does bronze have that uh, would be good for armor? They used about half as much tin and that way it would stay, it would be a more pliable metal. So you wouldn't really want something to shatter when it gets hit with a hammer or ax. So you would want it to still kind of be kind of like copper. Uh, why, you know, I guess, again, to refine enough iron to make, and then you've got the, the rust factor. Well, you know, you're out, the guys are marching, you know, you don't have all this oil to keep wiping your stuff down, you know, after a certain point you do. But again, they, they had just used bronze for, you know, 2000 years, 2,500 years. So there's just some things you don't want to let go of. You've already been making bronze helmets for thousands of years and all the civilizations before you, you would probably just keep doing it. I mean, and again, it took a lot less tin to make bronze armor than it did to make a bronze knife. You didn't need it as hard. So, um, they, once the trade was back up and going after the several hundred year dark age, then, you know, they could get tin again. And by then, you know, by the time Rome came along, they were all over the place. They were out, you know, they were in England. They, they were, you know, in charge of a lot of these tin deposits. So they, the flow was only interrupted for a few hundred years. So, and in a lot of cases, we went back to using bronze for some things, probably just, again, the ease a little bit a thousand degrees less to melt it versus iron and you know you can get a higher percentage of metal from the ore if you have good deposits versus iron just being the red dirt that we see and you know tons of that to, to get just a little bit of iron out of so i think it was just until you get an industrial way of doing things it just wasn't that productive and again until they made steel out of it it wasn't that great so iron is not steel so when we say the iron age we're not talking about knives like we have now you know that can be hardened and tempered we have basically like pot metal that's what they had for iron so again you know arrowheads things like that would have been great small knives 
uh, I think if you had a sword made out of it, it would have been too brittle and broke. And then again, you've got rust, you've got all these things. It's not as pretty of a metal. It takes a lot more labor to work it. Uh, I think somebody in one of the books I read was commenting on, you know, the, the Iron Age and said that what the children were born looking old, you know, it just gives you this, it, you know, it just gives you this mind visual of, of what it was like to go from working bronze to, to iron, you know, it's dirty, there's black soot everywhere. And I guess, you know, with you, you've got this metal, this bronze, you, you heat it up and you pour it into your mold. And just what a was uh, dirtier about iron? Dirt, you're getting it out of dirt. So you've got a whole lot more dirt to work with. You got to have a lot more fuel to get the same amount of iron from a lot more ore. The temperature is not the real thing. It's, you know, how many trees does it take to to cook a ton of dirt, you know, to get a little bit of iron out of versus finding a really good copper deposit and getting some tin ingots. You just measure that, mix it together, you know, and melt it and, and go with it. So, so you got to look at fuel, labor, all the logistics of getting iron made and then getting it up to the level of what we call iron, which would be, you know, not having so many of the impurities in it. So again, this, this took, you know, would have took, I mean, it took them a thousand years to get to using tin instead of arsenic. So why wouldn't it take a long time to develop iron technology to get it really well? It's not something that sprang up overnight. It it kind of did, but it, it at the time, comparably, I don't think iron was that much better. Uh, in one of the videos, I think your dad says, you know, you have an iron uh, arrowhead. It's going to, you know, fly farther. Well, it's smaller and for the weight, the, yeah, something like that. But But something that needs to be flexible and strong you know, you're getting into metallurgy and they really took them a while to work the bugs out to really make a bronze or, or a steel sword, you know, something like we would see in the Middle Ages to work better than bronze. It, it probably took until the Middle Ages to really get a, a good steel made. So, yeah, the the battle he's talking about is, I think, the Battle of Kadesh is when uh, Ramses yeah. uh, had the greatest Bronze Age army of all time, but he was facing the Hittites. Yeah, they, they had already been playing with it, you know, and they, Tutankhamun had a, an uh, iron dagger they found in, in his tomb that they, you know, possibly came from the Hittites. Uh, and they would say that that would have been worked from a meteorite. So that makes sense. A meteorite, you've already got a chunk of iron. It's already been extracted. There's no ore. You don't have to melt it into a liquid. So your, your temperature is a thousand. Now you're at the temperature of melting copper to get the iron, a pure piece of iron hot enough to hammer into a knife is about the same temperature to melt completely the copper into liquid and melt, mix it together. So, so we're easing into the bronze, I mean, into the iron age again, it, you know, it didn't happen overnight. They were working with it, but it wasn't better. So it wasn't until they just couldn't get the tin to make bronze that they were like, Oh, we got to start working with this iron. You know, we've got plenty of it and we'll work with it and refine it and spend a long time with that and make it better. So, so again, it, all the metal seems to go back to Anatolia. I mean, you you get just uh, all these different metals. The 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 Middle Assyrian Empire would send traders to get silver from Anatolia. Uh, this you know, two thousand BC. So uh, the Greeks they they've had silver. That's how they financed their their fleet of ships and the wall you know, that connected the harbor town to Athens. They built this huge wall. So, you know, metal is, that's the area for metal. Cyprus is right in between those. You've got, um, you know, it's the, that's where we get the word copper from, uh, the Latin. Oh, really? Cupros, I think. CU is the, on the periodic table for copper. That's mm -hmm. where it's the Latin version of that. So copper gets its name from the island of Cyprus. What are some of your favorite objects of ancient history that are made of metal. As far as just something really cool from way back then would be the Antikythera mechanism. It was, you know, it was made out of bronze. I think it's in the, it's 300 to 500 BC and it's this mm -hmm. got gears in it, like a hundred, it's got a lot of gears. I don't know, you know, and it, it was uh, to record, you know, to record time basically a different way than we do. It wasn't like a watch, but you know, say in a month long or a year long, Thing to have all those gears and to think about you know how precise without machines to stamp those things out you're doing it by hand with a with a file and getting all the teeth perfect and all these gears and the ratios of that to where you know you get 29 your month was 
you know, they've, they've x-rayed it and they've, you know, it's missing a lot of the pieces, probably over half of it's missing, but several people have tried to rebuild this thing. And what they seem to come up with is that it would measure the lunar cycles and you're, you know, you're, they didn't really keep up with the hours like we do, but they needed to know when to plant and when the next full moon was and that, that kind of thing. So just to be able to work with that precision in the gears and get the ratios out and then not have the gears hang up and bind up if this mechanism really worked, um, you know, no reason to see why it didn't. If, you know, it was on a ship, it was on a shipwreck, so it was badly decayed when they found it. But, you know, I, I would get, like to go back in time and see how that thing worked. And again, it goes back to copper. Copper was only so useful up until you could find something else to mix with it or until we needed it for electricity. And, you know, we use it so much more now in its pure form. But back then it didn't probably have a lot of value as a pure metal. Like we were talking about Otzi, he, he had this, it was like an ax. They sh it showed wear on it. Um, copper is only going to get hard from, from working it, beating it, bending it hammering on it you, you can't really heat it up and quench it like you do steel so you know they found that this thing was cast and then it was worked and it was hardened but but again it's a soft thing so you know it was ceremonial well you know if we can't find a use for anything else i guess we always say they were worshiping it or it was ceremonial but it would not have been the greatest tool again you got flint that's really hard you know that that was just great and it had been used for you know tens of thousands of years before that so some of the north american uses for the copper during that 9500 bc up to what 5000 bc and then they, they quit using it so so it would make you think that well they had people to to go in there and mine it you know when you scaled something up now it's worth it to go in there and get that copper ore out it's really pure but for a tribe of five or ten people never you would never want to go dig all that stuff up melt it down when you can go find rocks laying on the ground that will give you these super sharp edges you know that that even now today you know some surgeons use them for heart surgery they use these the black glass obsidian for their for their scalpels so you've got super sharp edges way before the invention of metal and civilization and industrialization. So why would you need to change that? You would only change it again when you're scaling things up. So for those few thousand years, we can just assume that it's coming out of the ice age. You know, civilization was good. They had enough time to, and they had the, uh, the, uh, you know, civilization was built up enough to get that or, and then at some point, it wasn't anymore. So they, they quit using it and they went back to this, to using their stone age tools. And I think when you go back around to the black sea, I think that happened on and off too. I, I think people went back to using, you know, obsidian was traded around the, the Cycladic islands. Uh, did I say that right? The, the, the Greek islands basically that, so they were trading black obsidian, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So, the first thing you're probably going to do when you can't get tin to make bronze anymore and everybody's reduced down to small tribes again, the population has been decimated. You, you don't have these big workforces. So you're going to go back to what is easy and what you know. So they would have went back to using their, their obsidian and their the stone tools for a while. And, you know, they're not that much inferior. I mean, yeah, they break a little easier. You can't go melt the stone down and recast it. So it's, but, but you can go get more rocks off the ground and make more of them. Right. So. It's not a process. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's all about what your needs are and what what is your manpower like. So. So uh, another thing, I mean, we we exchanged some photographs. Uh, I sent you some stuff of my father at Saqqara. They are from the 90s. So I guess the resolution isn't good enough. But you were discussing that and I wasn't exactly sure what you were looking at or what you were telling me or showing me with the pictures. So I was looking at this picture again. I've watched your dad's videos a lot. Uh, I think I've got them on a thumb drive. I fall asleep to them a lot. So there's a lot of times when I don't want to use my data for my hotspot when I'm working on the road or something. I would put those in some other shows that I have on history and just put it on for the background. So, you know, one day I was sitting there looking at it, you know, and the, your dad's video, I think it was the first cradles. And again, this perfect picture pops up of the Saqqara Pyramid. And I saw the picture, you know, I pause it, I zoom in, you know, I maybe even take a picture of it with my phone. And I'm looking and I, you know, again, I see these bricks that are sitting at an angle, you know, and, and it's only where this, this ridge is just a kind of an anomaly when you look the, and then in the next step above, it's a parallel, uh, 
it's parallel to that on the next section up. So again, I, you know, I'm seeing a ramp there uh, that was filled in later by the, the way these bricks right in that line were set. There's, there's no bricks sitting tilted, you know, and, and they just didn't put those in crooked. You know, they were way too meticulous about the way they did things. So it looks like where there was a ramp that maybe they brought the bricks and, and had them tapered down into a ramp. And then when they were done with the ramp, they just came and filled that back in with bricks to make, make it a solid wall and you're going to have some bricks in there that are tilted at the angle of the ramp and, and I think I indicated that in a picture just with I was doing it from my phone with two lines I just kind of drew across that so if you look okay. below those lines you can see that the bricks are tilted and you can like I said see where the bricks are like when they came in they brought a different batch of bricks and stacked them going up that ramp to fill it in and then those have weathered it, there's a lot of limestone around where I'm at and a lot of caves so I'm a caver, would go in these caves. So you're thinking about limestone while you're in there, especially if you study history. So, you know, we you can even see in a cave where the groundwater will eat out the, the acidity and the water will eat out the easiest to the, the, the softest layer. It will take that out and leave you with a cave. So same thing, you've got different layers of limestone. So depending on, you know, you can go up five feet and have a harder layer. It's just sediment. So how that sediment was presented, what was in it, and how it was compacted will give you different different types of limestone in the same quarry. So again, if they were pulling blocks from this one spot to build this wall, you would think that if they changed to a different layer, well, then you would see it coming up, you know, as they ran out of this and changed to this. But But for them to come in and put these few bricks in or rocks or stones of, uh, at that angle, it looks like they filled in with some limestone that they, and at the time it probably all looked the same. It just, you know, thousands of years later, they've weathered differently. So in the late nineties, early two thousands, they were using a lot of different colored brick mortar on houses. And so again, this, this is what got me to thinking about it being from my point of view, uh, that when you would see where they would do brick, they could only get so high. You can't do a whole wall in one day. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times when they were using this colored mortar, they wouldn't get it exactly the same the next day. And you would, even after the house was a year old, you could see where they stopped that day and then where the bricks, and again, maybe it's, you got to be in the business to notice it. To me, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And so you could see where they put these bricks on at this time. And then they came back later and put these bricks on, you know, whether it was the next day or a week later, you know, you can see where that, that was and so that is how through that kind of thinking is where I saw in that picture that those bricks are different in the way they were put in there so you know again that's for somebody some geologist to figure out I guess not me but I'm convinced that that's a ramp and that's how they did it and I guess at the end of the day I'm not writing books about it so right <laughs> that's what I keep telling them. I'm a scholar you're not a scholar but we have something to contribute to the discussion from our right. perspective so um, when you look at uh, the Great Pyramid, what is your theory about how they moved the blocks, how long it took, what, how, do, you know, how was this done? And from your perspective, as someone who has to move heavy things up steep angles. Oh, we just got through moving our shop. That's why I had to put this interview off. So, so we had uh, one piece of my equipment was 2,000 pounds. That's a ton. And it took uh, a five to one block and tackle pulley system and we even used the winch on my jeep and anchored to a ceiling to a ceiling anchor to lift it up and uh and it took a while to move that so from again yes from my perspective of moving heavy stuff it's 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 harder for me to think that they built that in 20 years than it would be for somebody that was just taught that say an archaeologist you're, you're taught how to dig you've learned a totally different skill set but in probably not moved a lot of stones. They move a lot of dirt. They do a lot of digging, but, you know, trying to move big cumbersome things into place, that's, it's just a construction thing. So, um, hmm, I think your dad had the best idea with the lunettes, make a wheel out of it. Either that, or I'd always thought, make a cylinder first and roll it up there and then finish it in place. So with my work, there's, there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can go take a whole lot of measurements on site and then go back to the shop and fabricate everything really precise. And then there's, or you can go and 
measure a piece, put a piece on on site and fab things on site. You're not as efficient on the job site doing it because you're not in the shop environment where you've got everything, but you do not have to be as precise. You could take one measurement, make one piece, put it on, measure the next piece from that. And then so you can do less measuring. You can do it with a bigger crew without having to teach people as much stuff. So, um, if I want to take a lot of measurements as I've gotten older, I like to work in the shop better. I'm three times faster in the shop. It's not as hot. I'm redheaded. I'm not in the sun anymore. So I've really worked on taking those measurements and, and getting out there to do that. So, so again, you, you look at the pyramid where there's, you got the same options here. Do we cut this block down to this exact size that makes this pyramid come out to this exact angle way over here in the quarry and then get it there? it's very possible uh, do we get it close and get it there do you know do we get it roughed in and then get it there do we make a cylinder out of it roll it into place and then make a block once we get it up to where we go uh the inside of the pyramid wasn't as you know you hear these people talk about you can't stick a playing card in between the blocks that was the outer layers when you get to the inside there was there were they did not spend that much time so maybe they took some of that rubble and filled in the gaps between some of the rougher blocks just to make it more compact, kind of like you would put sand or aggregate in, in something to how to hold it together to fill in the loose, you know, gaps and things. So you would have had all this material left. All this material was going to be left from quarrying anyway. So whether you had this material at the quarry, you could use it to build the ramp with, you know, if you carry the block up there and then work it, then you've got to do something with this material. You've either got to bring it back down or find somewhere in the pyramid to put it. Again, I without taking the pyramid apart, we just we won't know those things. So, <laughs> uh, but these are just in my mind that you know if I had to do it from from that perspective, uh, you know, rolling it is good. I think you know the they I've seen ideas where they use something similar to the shadoof the shadoof that lifts okay. the uh, the water. It's like got a weight on one end. It's just basically like a little mini crane, and they dip it mm -hmm. into the water to that's what they irrigate with. So this is mm -hmm. technology they already had. So, mm -hmm. you know, so again, when I needed to lift my 2000 pound break, I go digging through my cave rescue stuff. What would we use to haul a person out? And I've got all these pulleys and rope and all that stuff that goes with my caving and rope access kits. So I bring that to work. This is in my wheelhouse. So, so you would think nobody's really going to go out and, 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 you know, if you've got something that works, you're going to try to use that, I guess. So you would probably try to scale that up. But I don't know if you can get a big enough tree to make a big enough fulcrum to lift a two and a half ton stone four or five feet. Um, maybe you could use several of them. How many ropes would it take? You know, they didn't have nylon rope. Hemp rope works pretty good. Uh, it's really strong. You can use a lot of it. But, you know, how many pieces of rope? Can you put on there and get to a place and be able to pull on it, you know, without people getting in each other's way? You know, you've got the law of diminishing returns. Now you can only put so much rope on this thing and have so many people pulling on it before the people are in each other's way. So I think a ramp and rolling it, you know, just picking it up is just not the easiest way back then. I would not, you know, again, we, we looked at every way that we could roll my brake out of the shop and try to roll it up onto a trailer, put some casters on it and do all this stuff. So this is three or four guys that's been doing construction for a long time sitting around. You know, some guys have done timber framing. I've come from my background and we pull all our ideas together. And in about five minutes, we figure out, OK, this is the way we need to do it. So that aspect of it would not have changed. This is what we've got. These are the people that's got the most experience. So, you know, how do we get this? two ton block mode versus this one ton sheet metal break. So uh, the, but the, the thought process into getting it moved is the same. What are, what do we have that works? You know, what can we scale up from what we're already using and um, you know, just what tools do we have on hand? Uh, I don't think they invented the great pyramid and invented the technology at the same time and built that thing in 20 years. You know, they had some practice pyramids, but it's just hard is what two and a half million blocks, you know, and you hear these numbers all the time. They had to put a block in place every two minutes or something. I mean, you're talking about a lot of people. We can all speculate, you know, we can, we're not, we're not 
publishing a paper saying we figured something out. Yeah, the, step how, how knowledge transfers from generation to generation is also something that interests me and also motivated me to do, uh, to record my father because I said he wasn't finishing the book. So how do you get this to continue? Because some of the knowledge he had, I'm not hearing other places. So many things uh, that he talked about, I would want to go and, and look back over. Uh, I think for him making those lectures 20 years ago, a lot of times when you go back and look at, at people doing similar stuff 20 years ago, so much of that knowledge has been superseded by, by new discoveries. And I think with me kind of keeping up with what's going on now, he, he was really spot on then. Like, you know, even if he was speculating, films that there was very few things that were just wrong, you know, like it, well, everything. What's interesting also, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, when I told him about the new discoveries and the new theories about the Sphinx, he said, oh, it makes perfect sense. He said I there mean, should be more cross-disciplinary collaboration. I mean, he did not, it was almost like, oh, I guess he was waiting for it. Just to sum up here, you showed me a bunch of very beautiful uh, items that you're making. Can you tell me about uh, your copier work with stills? Oh, yeah. So going back, oh, so I fell off a roof 10 years ago and I couldn't work uh, for about six months. And then after that, I could only work in the shop. So it was about a year. I broke my leg, shattered this shoulder, and I got a little scar right here from where I I hit the ground, can't get out and do stuff. My buddy calls me. He's like, oh, I was watching this show and they built a still on there. And I've got all these scrap pieces. So I go out to the shop. I look around. I have a chimney pot that was octagon shaped I had made that didn't didn't sell. It's like, wow, I've got everything I need to make a still here. All right. So he comes over and we, you know, I learned how to solder with irons and had to make a couple more tools we did just bam we just did it i looked up you know what is the evaporation point of uh water we know that it's 212 ethanol evaporates at 173 methanol that that is in the fermentation process too in trace amounts it evaporates at 153 so you've got these three temperatures you go slow so you're going to evaporate the methanol off first and that's the first part you throw out that's why you always hear people oh you throw the heads off or whatever people call it uh and so i taught myself how to do that getting a little bit of tips i didn't just sit isolated in a box and figure it out but there was nobody that just like here's how you do this i had to go around to you know a guy that did sheet metal work back in the 60s learned from a trade school how did you do stills back then and so i learned spent a few sundays with him what tools did he use and then i you can't even get some of them anymore so i had a machinist took copies had copies made of his tools that you can't get anymore and had a machinist make them so from that aspect i learned the mechanics of how to do round stuff and then okay then you got to learn the chemical aspect of of that all right that was easy enough to figure out so i started making stills uh, and then any uh, ancient inspiration going on with this uh manufacture yeah, just, of alcohol well when i'm sitting there thinking okay they made beer that goes way back before writing wine they've been making that they had copper they apparently had solder why did they not figure out how to distill why did it take until the you know middle ages but they had everything they needed to do it back then but we don't find any historical record of stills back then for for whatever reason. So I did that for a year. I can actually say I've fed my family with, and feed them moonshine, but I fed them with that, you know, that trade uh, for a year, you know, when I couldn't get on a roof and work. So, so what is your um, current area of interest or something you're looking into? I'm still studying and reading, but as far as like pursuing the answer to a question hard and heavy, like I was a few years ago, now I'm kind of into uh, homesteading. A couple of weeks ago, we dug a cistern. So I studied on that for a while. I found a place, you know, looked at my land for a while and picked a spot. And a couple of weeks ago, after a year or two of, you know, looking at what it does during the summer and the in the winter and during the rainy season and night, I picked a spot. We started digging and it filled up with water. We've got a cistern now. We dug a hole in the ground. That's really all we did. And water filled it up. This is not any great technology, but again, it's something that we don't have to do every day. Um, you know, we take our water for granted, we take our power for granted, and I'll tell you, it's, it's just a, it's an eye-opening experience to go out into a raw piece of land, and again, I've got internet, 
I've got Amazon Prime, you know, I can go order stuff. So I'm not, uh, I've got an internet hotspot. I'm talking to you right now from an off the grid location. So it's not quite as off the grid as it was way back then. We were still communicating with people. But, uh, but again, I like to look back at, you know, how did people do things before they had all this tech technology? So find the old answer and it's usually the low tech way and it's usually tried and true. Maybe it takes a little more effort, but maybe not as prone to fail. My solar panels are always doing something funny. Even if the cloud passes over, they stop making power and I jump up and run out there and try to figure out why at first. But, you know, I'm so that that's been my thing lately uh, is just playing around with alternative energy just trying to combining the old with the new it sounds like yeah and and just trying to live sustainably i guess that i kind of avoid some of these new words but so yeah i guess it is trying to live sustainably we'll go ahead and say it and um but but it's not something new it's something that we forgot and something we need to go back to people used to live sustainably people had gardens you know and people had chickens there was no inflation of egg prices even 40 years ago because people would just go to the guy down the road and get eggs from him i mean it was only when you can't you know and so now i know lots of people that are, have gotten chickens in the last since covid you know the price of eggs and their staples and supply chain and a lot of people are going back to that you know having little gardens even in their apartment windowsills and doing herb garden it's becoming a thing again and so i guess when i do something i have to do it with 24 acres and do it with no electricity and no city waters it's a pleasure talking to you and uh, I think it's a really valuable insight that you have on all this material. So I really thank you for coming and contributing to no, this, I hope to I was this able, discussion. I hope, I hope I'm able to contribute something useful. And like I said, I hope, hope it turns out good. So like I said, I've enjoyed it. Well,